Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Stand your feet. I'm going to get down on my knees and let's go before the Lord in prayer tonight. Father, tonight we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for what you've already done in this church service, God. Thank you for your presence, God. Thank you for the special touch of the Holy Spirit, God. And thank you, Lord, for the promises of God that as we draw near, that you draw near to us and that you inhabit the praises of your people, God. So, Lord, we know assuredly that where two or more are gathered, there you are in our midst, God. And so thank you for being in the midst of your church tonight. Holy Spirit, come and speak to us tonight. Be our teacher. Be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the direction, the understanding, the knowledge of God that we need for each and every one of our individual lives, God. Pray that as we open up your word, that you open it up to us. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to have good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown, and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives, God. Lord, we don't just ask this blessing for ourselves. Also, we would ask it for all the churches that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. There are brothers and sisters, Lord. We love them. At no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building one kingdom, and that's yours, Lord. And God, we do remember our family of God here at The Rock. We remember all of our brothers and sisters that right now aren't feeling well in their physical bodies, experiencing pain. Maybe they even got a bad doctor's report. Right now, in the name of Jesus, we pray for complete and total healing. We declare the word of the Lord that by your stripes they were healed and that this sickness cannot stay, but it must go. The pain cannot stay, but it must go. Thank you for healings in the sanctuary, God. Thank you for healings out there wherever they're at, God. We thank you, Lord, that by your stripes... We were healed and that there was none feeble among Israel, God. And so may it be said of the body of Christ that none of us is feeble, none of us is ill, none of us is sick, Father God, or hurt or in pain, God. We do not accept that, God. We accept your healing power right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you for it, God. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody in agreement said? Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. I want to take a moment and welcome those of you that are on the live stream tonight. We just thank you for joining us. Glad that you could be with us wherever you're at all over the world. It's a privilege and an honor to be able to speak into your lives too. And I believe that God's going to speak to you right where you're at. Tonight we're talking about living bigger for the Lord. And this is part number two. By way of review, just to, just to kind of rewind your thinking and remind you of what we talked about a couple weeks back when we were in part number one, we discussed thinking bigger. If we're going to live bigger for the Lord, we're going to have to think bigger for the Lord. Why? Because our our thoughts turn into attitudes and our attitudes turn into actions. And so therefore, if we're going to live bigger for the Lord in our actions and in our lifestyle, then we're going to have to start thinking bigger for the Lord. You remember I asked you to pick a number. We all examined our numbers that we picked and we uh, we all had different numbers. Some of us had, you know, a really small numbers. Some of us had a little bit larger numbers. Very few had very, very large numbers. And so we talked about why, what was the motivation behind that? What was the reasoning behind that? Kind of fun because I had a lot of people coming up to me after the last time we got together and talked about this saying, you know what, I, I picked this number because it was my sports number or I picked that number because it was God's number, you know. And, and people had different reasons why they chose the numbers that they chose, and they could actually identify and see what was going on in their life. And you remember, we talked about the reasons why we don't think bigger. First of all, we said it's because we're not thinking, you know, plain and simple. One of the reasons why we don't think bigger is because we're not thinking. And we need to start prompting ourselves and getting ourselves into a habit of thinking about what we're thinking about. Are you listening? Secondly, we talked about that, uh, you know, it could be just laziness. In our society, in our culture, oftentimes apathy and lethargy come in, and and, and we just don't want to think bigger. Why? Because that takes responsibility. It takes hard work, and we miss out on God opportunities. Finally, we said that uh, maybe disappointment could come. We used an example, and we'll launch out from that same example. But sometimes disappointments get in the way of us thinking bigger because we, we thought bigger, and then we were disappointed, and so we shut it down. We said, listen, I'm not going that route again because I don't want to get involved in that pain of the process again, and, and I don't want to doubt God, or I don't want to you know, doubt myself or my situation or any of that kind of stuff. And so because of disappointments, we shut it down. Now, As I was thinking about some of the answers that came to me, too, I I, I started to think, could it be that maybe sentimentalism stops us from thinking bigger? Maybe because we're attached to something in our past, like our parents or our culture or something that happened to us in the past, that it stops us. Why? Because we don't want to identify with the bigger. We want to identify with where we were at and, and at this time. And now, listen, I'm not telling you to despise small beginnings. No, the Bible clearly speaks against that. 
I'm not telling you to despise the value of one. No, the Bible clearly tells us that Jesus Christ went after the one. And so we have to keep a perspective of in our big thinking, there has to be small things that are a part of that big thing. So when we take a look at something like sentimentalism or maybe our upbringing or even, how about this one, our view of God. Wow, maybe our view of God could actually stop us from thinking bigger because we think that God is big, I am small, and that's the proper order of things, and therefore God can think the big thoughts because his ways are higher than our ways, and I think the small thoughts here on earth because God can do exceedingly abundantly above all that I could ask or think, and rather than enlarge our heart, we look at ourselves and shrink down ourselves, kind of like the children of Israel when they were going up against the giants of the land, and they said, we were like grasshoppers and their sight, and so we were in our own sight. And so we got to start thinking bigger. We got to start expanding. We got to got to start getting bigger. So the next question we asked was, well, how can we think bigger? Well, we talked about getting vision, going up to the heights, getting seeing things bigger than ourselves, getting inspiration, seeing things in the Word of God, seeing things in our prayer times, getting that God vision on the inside of us. Why? So that we can start to think bigger. Secondly, we talked about getting faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Get into church, get into the word. Uh, get around people that, that live and eat and drink and breathe faith. Faith-filled friends that can encourage you and lift you up and ask the right questions and, and, and prompt you and, and, and provoke you in some senses, in some good senses. Finally, we talked about number three, getting God. Why? Because God is so big that you can't get around God and stay small. No, God starts to touch your life, gets you healthy. Your, your life starts to grow and starts to expand, and all of a sudden, you are a spiritual giant rather than a tiny, weeny, little, withered-up thing. Even God can take the mustard seed and turn it into a great tree. Why? Because that's what happens with God, because God is a big God, and God wants to expand and enlarge our lives. You got your Bibles tonight? All right, praise God. If you don't, it's okay. We'll put it up on the overheads for you, but start bringing your Bibles so that you can find these places in the Word of God. Mark them down. Get back to them when you need them. Isaiah chapter 54, please. Turn with me in the Word of God to Isaiah chapter number 54. Very familiar verse. When talking about living bigger, when talking about enlarging, when talking about living a big life, Isaiah chapter 54, we're going to be in verse number one and read through verse number three. Isaiah chapter 54, starting in verse number 1, we're going to read through verse number 3. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 1 says this. It says, Sing, O barren, you who have not born. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not labored with child. Now, that's really an oxymoron if you think about it. Here's somebody who has not had a child, wants a child, and yet the Bible is telling them, hey, you got no children? Go ahead and start singing. Break out the Martinelli's, dance, have a party. Why? Let's take a look at it. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. Now, notice that it says, says the Lord at the end of that verse. That means that God is speaking and God is telling us, commanding us to do something. And God is declaring something. And truth is not what the facts say here on the earth. Facts say she's barren. She's got no kids. So why should she be happy? No, God says, I want you to break forth in song. I want you to cry aloud. I want you to make a spectacle. I want you to declare it. I want you to be happy. I want you to smile and dance. Why? Because more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman. What does that mean? That means that God is declaring something. God is speaking something that be not as if it were. And God, when he sends forth his word, God will look after his word to perform it. So therefore, when God says break forth into singing, because for more are the children of the desolate, that means that there's something coming. That means that something big is about to happen. That means that there are children coming and more are the children of the desolate, God says. So if you're in a place of small right now, and you're in a place of little right now, or you're in a place of none right now, or in a place of zero right now, your hero is coming, Jesus Christ, and he's saying, I want you to cry aloud, I want you to sing, because I'm about to enlarge your life. Church, I believe that there is a season coming to the rock where God is going to start enlarging us. God is going to start bringing greater capacity into this church. You know, we've been declaring that every time we get together and give an offering, increase capacity. What are we crying out for? That the more are the children of the desolate 
than the children of the married woman. Why? Because even though we're in San Bernardino and there's a whole lot of zero all around us, the city is bankrupt, folks. The news came in and went looking for people working in the city. They couldn't find but two people. There's a whole lot of zero, a whole lot of shrinking, a whole lot of reduction going on around us. And yet in that moment, God is saying, oh city, oh San Bernardino, oh people of God, I want you to lift up your voice. I want you to cry aloud. I want you to think big. Why? Because I'm declaring something to you. Something big's about to break loose. Something's going to break forth in this place. I'm getting a little excited. Verse number two. Look at what he says. He says, enlarge the place of your tent. Let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. Wait, what is the terminology that's going on? Look at this. Enlarge the place of your tent. Let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare. Don't hold back. Spend the money. Go the distance. Put in the effort. Lengthen your cords. And strengthen your stakes. What's going on? Well, I remember when my wife and I were pregnant with our first child. And we found out that it was going to be a little girl. Oh, my goodness. The joy that came to us. We just couldn't contain ourselves. My wife had believed God for a little girl. Knew, she, knew her name from the time she was very young. Knew she wanted to have the girl first. And so God blessed us with this little baby girl. And so there we were. And we, we, we knew this girl was coming. And what did we start to do? You know what we started to do. We broke out the pink paint. And so myself, alongside some of my family members and some of my friends, we all went and we started putting up chair rail and, and we had different colors of pink. You know, we had the dark pink on the bottom and then the light pink on the top. And then we even went as far that my wife was going through magazines and she found a room that was real fancy. You know, it was yellow and white with black pinstripes and feathers and this and that. And so she said, I want to do this, only pink. So I said, ooh, girl, that looks good. We're going to make that happen. Right, and so I'm in the I'm in the room, literally up on a chair with with uh, my buddies who now are, are some of the pastoral staff here at the Rock, and, and and at the time we were just kids, you know, and we're all in there, and we've got a a yardstick and a paint pen, putting the black pinstripes down and and painting the white paint and the pink paint. What were we doing? We were getting ready. We were preparing. We were making room. This this little bundle of joy that was coming to us wasn't going to live as a pauper. Oh no, she was going to start out in the palace. Why? Because hey. Number one, she was ours, right? Number two, she was the first girl coming in a line of grandsons. And so we knew that any princess that was coming on the scene needed a castle all her own. So, so we, we started preparing the room. That's what God is speaking. God says, when I burst something on the inside of you, when you're pregnant, when you know that something's coming, it's time to start getting ready. Enlarge the place of your tents. Let them stretch out the curtains of your dwelling. Start to make room. Do not spare don't think small. Don't go back to the way that it was when you were in the world. No, if you're going to dream the God dream, you've got to go the God distance. He says, do not spare. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. I love that, lengthen and strengthen. See, we've got to build ourselves up, church. We, we've got to get ready. We've got to stretch. You know, exercise, when you stretch, it actually does something to your body. You know, you start to stretch out and you start to, you know, you start to do different stretches and things like that. It actually strengthens your body. It actually physically does something to you when you start to stretch and you start to lengthen out. Now, all of a sudden, you have abilities that you didn't have before, and you can actually stretch out those muscles and get those things in place to where you can handle what's coming. See, there is a blessing coming. There, there is an abundance coming. There, there, there is bigger things coming, but church, we got to get strong. we got to get ready. we got to get healthy. We gotta, that, see, that's, that's the reason why we have such a healthy church, because healthy things grow, and as well because healthy things can sustain Growth. That's why we don't branch out far. We build the root real big, and then we allow from that root the outreach to branch out and the ministries to branch out and the world missions to branch out. Why? Because there's a healthy, solid, strong church that can handle the large assignment that God has for us. That's what this is talking about. Verse number three. Verse number three. Take a look at it. Verse number three. For you shall expand to the right and to the left. And your descendants, oh, wait a second, weren't we just talking about a barren woman? Weren't we just talking about somebody who had no kids? Now your descendants, see, the vision is bigger than just this right here. I don't have a child, one child. No, God is all of a sudden expanding the thinking. He, he's putting a larger vision in, and he says, and your descendants 
will inherit your tent, the place that you live. No, the nations. See, God doesn't think small. God thinks big. God thinks worldwide. God thinks influence and impact and generationally. God thinks God thoughts. And it's time, church, for us as Christians who have a new nature to start to think bigger for the Lord so that we can live bigger for the Lord. And your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. Church, San Bernardino, I don't know if you've driven through lately. Maybe you live in the middle of it. Praise God that you're there because you are going to make the desolate city inhabited. You are going to infiltrate. You are going to be the one that fulfills the prophecy that all the earth shall see my glory, declares the Lord. You are the West Coast distributor of God's goodness. You are carrying the King of Kings, the Spirit of God on the inside of you and taking it and restoring the city. See, I believe that in the future, San Bernardino is going to be a desirable place. San Bernardino is going to be known for revival, for holiness, for godliness, for strong churches. Not just the rock, but man, I, I just believe that there are churches on every street corner that are all going to be filled because of the glory of God. Can you say amen? amen. See, when, when you, it's time for us, church. It's our time. It's our time to live bigger for the Lord. You're there in Isaiah chapter 54. Turn with me to the book of Genesis. Book of Genesis, chapter 12. Genesis chapter number 12. See, Abram had left his father. Ab uh, 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 his father had just passed away, Terah. And Terah had just passed away, and now all of a sudden something happens in Abram's life. Abram was with his father. They were living in Haran, if you remember that. And, and we talked about disappointments. Could have been, could have been that... Terah was disappointed with the, at the death of his son, and therefore when he came to the place with the namesake of his son, he stopped there. Here Abram now has something happen in his life. His father passes away. Verse number 12, now the Lord had said to Abram. So this is a past tense thing. God had already spoken to Abram. Abram was connected to his father, connected to his family. And again, could be, I'm not saying this is Bible or this is law, but it could be that here Abram was because of the respect for his father and was not traveling as of yet but had already heard the commandment of the Lord. See, God, God gives us his direction. God waits patiently for us to follow. And so here Abram now had heard the Lord, and now Abram is walking by faith in the promise of God. We'll see this as we go. What did the Lord said to Abram? It says, get out from your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, we know that that's speaking of Jesus Christ. Speaking of the, the, the prophecy to Abram that through his seed comes the Messiah. And Abram, we're told in the Bible that he believed God looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. And it was accounted to him as righteousness before God. Even though Abram, you can read stuff in, in his life that, you know, maybe he, would, he messed up a little bit. Maybe he didn't do things the right way all the time, but he was a man of faith and he believed God and he went after the promises of God and walked in obedience to the will of the Lord. And so in our life, we have to see that this is a life that, like Abram, it's got to be bigger than ourselves. Our life can't stay just us. It's got to start to go in other people's. What does he say? He says, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. See, Abram, it's not just about you. I'm going to bless you. Why? So that you can be blessed, so that you can get rich, so that you can be the one, so you can be the man. No, I'm going to bless you to be a blessing. Now, all of a sudden, that's bigger than himself. That's bigger than just one generation. That's bigger. Why? All the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is early in the story, folks. This is Genesis chapter number 12. I mean, we haven't even hit Exodus. We haven't even hit the midpoint of Genesis. Early on in the story, he's saying all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And that means that, the, Abram, this is a big thing. This is something that's, that's bigger than you are. And we have to understand that the life we live as Christians is bigger than we are. Bigger than me as an individual, and now it reaches to other people as well. It's no longer me or you. Are you listening? No longer me or you. Now it's me and you. Well, that's quite different. It's no longer exclusive, 
but now it's inclusive. You hear what I'm saying? It's also bigger in time frame. It now outlasts my lifetime, and it now goes into legacy and into eternity. Why? Because all the families of the earth shall be blessed. All means all. That means even the previous ones that were looking forward by faith like Father Abraham was. Wow. Finally, it's bigger than my current capacity. We've already talked about this. That's why we, we have to lengthen our cords. That's why we have to strengthen our stakes. That's why we have to open up the curtains. That's why we have to enlarge the place of our dwelling. It's bigger than my current capacity. It has to come from a bigger source than I currently can count on, currently can contain. See, it, otherwise, it, I would have already done it. I would have already had the bigger thing in my life. Why? Because I had the capacity for it in myself. So... What do I need to dream for? What do I need to think for? Why do I need hope? Why do I need faith? Why do I need God to get involved if I, in my own capacity, can do these things? See, God wants us to start to think bigger. Why? So that we can look at ourselves and feel bad that I don't have the resources to do it? No. God wants us to think bigger and start to live a bigger life. Why? So that we can trust Him, believe Him, step out in faith, bring the, bring the, bring the spiritual and the things that are unseen into the natural and the things that are seen. I read a quote that realists know where they're going. Dreamers have already been there. I like that. You see, before you ever sat in a seat in this sanctuary, there were two people named Pastors Jim and Deborah Cobray who had already seen it. Before anybody was ever baptized in that fountain in the middle of our courtyard, there was somebody that had already dreamed that. Before any of the tiles were placed in these steps or out there in front of that angel or, or in any of the bathrooms, somebody had already seen it, it with the eye of faith. Therefore, we have to have an increased capacity, start to believe God, start to think bigger, dream bigger, start to declare bigger, start to live bigger, and then bring that unseen spiritual thing by faith into the natural realm that I live in. And listen, it doesn't just bless Pastor Jim and Deborah Cobray. It blesses the masses that attend church here at The Rock and all over the world. My goodness. My goodness. See, I want to dream a dream that's so big that if God's not in it, it's destined to fail. Moses said, God, unless you go with us, we're not going. I want your presence, God. I, I, I need you more than I need the thing. I need you more than I want the land. I want your presence, God, and, and, and I, we can't do this without you. Don't send an angel before us. See, that would have been enough. God could have sent an angel, drove out the inhabitants, could have took care of everything. But no, Moses says, we're not going if you don't go, God. We need Jesus. We need you. Love what Pastor Jim often says. He says that he'd rather fail while trying to do something for God than to succeed at doing nothing for God. Church, we've got to start mobilizing ourselves, start to get going with the things of God, get, start to dream bigger, start to think bigger, start to expand, start to get outside of ourselves, start to make ourselves uncomfortable. Otherwise, we get lazy, we get apathetic, and we get disappointed. Are you listening? Genesis 18, 14, God speaking to Abraham. Abraham's talking about, how can I have this baby? And what does the angel says to him? He says, is anything too hard for the Lord? It was repeated several times throughout the New Testament, but in the Old Testament, here's the first time we see this. Is anything, is a baby at age 100 too hard for the Lord? Is a baby at age 90 for your wife too hard for the Lord? Why are you laughing at the promise of God as if it was unrealistic or incredible? Is anything too hard for the Lord? See, church, is it too hard for the Lord to have waiting lines outside to come to church? Is it too hard for the Lord that we could build ramps that go straight out to the freeways and to the surrounding streets? Is it too hard for the Lord that we could build a facility to feed more people across the way and expand our, our youth ministries and our children's ministries and, and build a building for La Roca as they're growing? Is it too hard for the Lord to, to, to build a legitimate school that starts at grade K and goes all the way through high school so that we can train up our kids in the ways of the Lord? Is it too hard for the Lord to build a medical facility or transitional housing or go and rock in the street or having extension campuses in, in faraway places where thousands of people are coming to the Lord. Is it too hard for the Lord? No, it's not. No, it's not. 
Abraham had received a promise of blessing and multiplying. The thing that blows me away about this, okay, think about this. God is telling Abraham, blessing I will bless you, multiplying I will multiply you. Your descendants shall be, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Now, God is saying this to Abram. Now, when we think about this, we think about just God and Abram. There they are. Abraham has nothing, right? And it's just him talking to God. I, and I almost picture like in the middle of a desert, you know, because he had just moved from one place to another place, and now here he is talking to God. And so it's just Abram. He got nothing around him. The reality is, is that Abram was not just rich, but very rich. Rich. We'll see this in a moment as we go through. Abram had a lot of stuff. As the world was concerned, Abram was a very wealthy man. He was a great man in the sense of influence and, and in the sense of other people looking to him. You, you see that when Abimelech talks to him. You see that when Pharaoh talks to him. You see that all throughout the word of God that Abram was a very influential, very wealthy person. And when he came through, people noticed he had so much stuff, him and his nephew couldn't even stay on the same plot of land. Now, back then, it wasn't like we think about, you know, the field over there or something. No, it was land, like in the middle of nowhere land. You know what I mean? Like Alaska, the great frontier land. There wasn't cities and stuff like we have now. And so here this man is that's very blessed, and God says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to multiply you. Now, now, that means one of two things. It means one of two things. It means that either the blessing is deeper than just wealth, which it is. Or that we really do need to expand our thinking, which we do. Let me say that again. It means one of two things. The very fact that a blessed man is going to be even more blessed, that means one of two things. It means that either the blessing is deeper than just wealth, which it is, or that we really do need to expand our thinking, which we do. Hello. We just went deep. Praise the Lord. Now listen, wherever you're at, whatever you would reckon yourself to be right now, blessed, not blessed, rich, poor, doesn't matter. The reason why is because in the New Testament, turn there with me, Galatians chapter 3, verse 14. Galatians chapter 3, verse number 14. In the New Testament, we're told something fascinating. This is going to bake your noodle. <laughs> Galatians chapter 3, verse 14, says that Jesus Christ died on the cross, was cursed for us, verse 14, that the blessing of Abram, do I have your attention? Yeah. That the blessing of Abraham, who was very wealthy and had a promise of blessing on his life, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, I don't have time to get into all of the realities of what that verse is saying because it goes into our salvation. It goes into the blessing of Abraham. But listen, if Abraham was a blessed man in the position he was in, in that his life was going to be blessed, that he would be a blessing, that all the families of the earth shall be blessed, this is the fulfillment of that prophecy. We can see that in Christ Jesus, now we are blessed by believing Abraham's faith because of the blessing of God that was upon him, because of the seed of God that came through him. But not only that, we receive the blessing of Abraham on our lives. That means that you, church, are a blessed people. That means that you, church, are blessed to be a blessing and that in you, through the seed, through Jesus Christ, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Are you listening? See, your potential just went through the roof. Why? Because the promise of the Spirit through faith. When you got God on the inside, it doesn't matter. What's coming against you doesn't matter the circumstance, doesn't matter the situation you're in, doesn't matter what you're facing, doesn't matter the obstacle or the hurdle that you have to get over. When you have God on the inside, nothing is impossible. All things are possible to him who believes. Real fast, I want to go through a couple of things. Real fast, we got to go quickly. Living bigger for the Lord means something. 
means some things. If we're going to do this, church, which I believe you want to, I want to, let's all do this together. But it means some things for us. And we've got to take a look at these things. Living bigger for the Lord means, number one, sacrifice for the promise. See, you've got to start here. Because Jesus didn't even obtain the promise until there was a sacrifice. Do you hear what I just said? See, if Jesus would have lived his life, the seed of Abraham, capital S, speaking of Jesus, if he would have came and lived his life and not went to the cross, we'd still be under a curse. He had to sacrifice in order to take hold of the promise on behalf of us. And now we are in Christ Jesus, and God's children become his children the same way. Sacrifice. You lay down your life, you pick his life up. There has to be a sacrifice first. You have to die to self in order to live to Christ. You have to crucify the old man in order to live in the new man. You have to put off the old man, which is corrupt according to the flesh. And you have to put on the new man, which is renewed according to Christ. First comes the sacrifice. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. The cross came first. Following came second. See, there has to be a sacrifice. If we're going to live bigger for the Lord, we've got to sacrifice for the promise. We've got to lay down our life. Genesis chapter 12, verse number 1. Let's take a look back at it together. Genesis chapter 12, verse number 1. We'll play around in Genesis for the rest of the evening. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. See, if Abram wanted the land that God was going to show him, if he wanted the promise, he had to get out of his country. He had to sacrifice his identity. He had to sacrifice familiarity. He had to sacrifice his culture and his background and his upbringing and his education and the place that he had already come to in his country. And he had to go out from your family, from his family. These were people that he loved. These were people that they held on to one another. These were people that they knew and that they appreciated. People that went through him with a hard time when his brother died and when his dad was going through a struggle. See, he had to get out from his family, from his upbringing, from the, his ways. And look at and from your father's house. What is that? That's the namesake. See, that was a hard thing in those days to get away from. It wasn't like it was today. Your family, the line went on, and if you abandoned that, you abandoned the family. You were like a traitor. And so here God is telling him, I want you to turn your back on everything that you had built up, everything that you had, everything that you knew, everything that you thought was cool and, and, and appreciated, and I want you to lay that down, Abram, and I want you to follow me to a land that I will show you. Now, if you want the promise, you've got to sacrifice all this stuff. Wow. Wow, my goodness. You're there in uh, Genesis 12, 1. Take a look at verse number 4. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Now, I believe Pastor Luke was talking about this. 75 years old, just a move across the street is difficult. <laughs> now you're talking about a 400-mile journey from Haran to Canaan? What's up with that? No, not just that. Verse 5. Then Abram took Sarai, his wife. So now you've got a 75-year-old Abram, a 65-year-old Sarai, and Lot, his brother's son. Now you've got your brother's son that's tagging along. Oh, not just that. And all their possessions that they had gathered and the people whom they had acquired. Now we find out in the next couple of chapters that there were 300 men born in Abram's own house that went with him to war. May not have been 300 men at this time, may have been less than that, but even if you took it down by two thirds, let's say, that's still 100 men with all their stuff. This was no little move. This was a big deal. It took time, it took effort, it took patience, it took a lot of hard work. So they departed to go to the land of Canaan, so they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land in the place of Shechem as far as the terebinth tree of Morah, and the Canaanites were then in the land. you know what that means? There's trouble. Because anytime you see the Canaanites, 
giants in the land, inhabitants of the land, fortified cities, people that don't want you moving in on their territory. That's their land. They own it. See, this, this was difficulties. This was problems. This was frustrations. This was trials. It's a sacrifice to go through that stuff. He could have been comfortable in his own country with his own people and his own family, and yet here God is bringing him to a place where the Canaanites are in the land. Verse 7, then the Lord appeared to Abram. Then the Lord appeared to Abram. Then the Lord. Sacrifice comes first. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said to your descendants, I will give this land. Now, Abram didn't have any children yet. Now all of a sudden, God's speaking about descendants. To your descendants, I will give this land. He already promised him he'd make him a great nation. To your descendants, I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. You know what an altar is? A place where sacrifices are made. And the place where Abram lived was a place of sacrifice. It was also a witness to everybody around him. All the Canaanites, they had their idols. They had their things that they lifted up and they raised up. Abram didn't lift up an idol. He lifted up an altar. He said, I'm going to live my life as a life of sacrifice for all to see. Just like Jesus lifted up on the cross for everyone to pass by and to look to. Now here's a man who's going to live a sacrificial life and be a witness and a testimony for others. If we're going to live bigger for the Lord, it means sacrifice for the promise. Second thing, second thing, I like this one. Living bigger for the Lord means dwell on the promise. Dwell on the promise. Now, you're there in Genesis 12. Turn with me to Genesis 13. Genesis 13. We've got to take a look at this. This is so cool. Genesis chapter 13, verse 14 through verse number 18. Talking about dwelling on the promise. See, sometimes we start to think bigger for the Lord, and then we forget about what we were thinking about. Not to happen to anybody other than Pastor Dan. Anybody honest enough? All right, a couple of you guys out there. Thank you. The rest of you all? Mm-mm-mm. <laughs> but seriously, though, there's times where I've been woken up in the middle of the night with this grandiose dream or with a song or with an idea or with a message or with something, and I went, that's awesome. And I went back to bed in the morning. I woke up, and I said, now, what was I thinking about? It happened to you. I can tell by how you're laughing. <laughs> Genesis 13, verse 14 through 18. Genesis 13, starting verse 14. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. Now, he didn't just say look one time and see. Take a look at what he says. Look at what he says. He's looking at the land. He's looking around. Okay. And then he goes on and he says this, verse 16, And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Now, don't you know that when God throws down the gauntlet like that, throws down a challenge like that, Abram, I want you to look around, and I want you to see the land, and then if you can count the dust, what does that mean? Abram probably bent down and started counting. One, two, three, four, five. This is madness. Right? Why? Because I'm just here, there's all this. Right? What did God do? God just expanded his vision, but God also threw down a challenge. I can't number that. Okay, so that's how your descendants are going to be. You can't number them. And so now he's dwelling, he's thinking about it, he has to look real hard, he spent some time on it. Now, not just that, take a look at this. Verse 17, arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. How long does that take? He didn't have a car. He didn't have a bicycle. He didn't have a skateboard. There was no metro system. There was no trains, planes, and automobiles. It wasn't nothing that he was going to get on that was going to be a super express. He wasn't going to fly in a helicopter to check everything out and see if he liked it. No, not going to happen. He had to physically walk throughout the land. How much time does that take? A day? Months? Probably more like it, right? So here Abram is walking through the width and the length of the land. My goodness. He's taking time. He's dwelling on it. He's thinking about it. He's seeing it. He's got it in front of him all the time. Verse 18, then Abram moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. What does that mean? That means that Abram camped out on the promise. 
You've got a promise from God, if you've got a vision from God, if you've got a thought from God, if you've got something bigger, something that you're thinking about, something that you're dreaming about, something that you know is the God dream, the God vision, the God thing that's for your life, then you've got to camp out on it. Don't just go make it happen. Sometimes we think, oh, I'm taking it by force. Okay, maybe it's not the timing. Maybe you're not ready. Maybe you're not strong enough yet. That's why I said lengthen and strengthen, right? So, yeah, get ready for it, but then wait. Dwell on it. Think about it. Pray about it. Keep it in front of your eyes. You know, when we were about ready to start a bus ministry here at The Rock, I remember the, the, I wasn't around during this time, but the story is, is that uh, Pastor Jim had a, had a picture in his wallet. It wasn't of his children. It wasn't of his grandchildren. It was of a bus. Now, I've seen the picture of the bus, the beautiful picture of a beautiful white long bus, and eventually that bus was acquired, and had the name of the rock on the side of it, and that was our first bus that we bought in order to start bringing people to church. What was that all about? That meant that every time that he opened up his wallet, there it was, vision in front of him. See, you, you may have a God dream on the inside of you. It's time to take a picture and put it up in front of you. Time to get a verse and memorize it. Time to get something and write it down. Time to, time to take something and put it in a place where you remember it. Put it on the refrigerator door. Put it on the, the mirror where you brush your teeth every morning. Why? To keep that vision in front of you. One of my friends, I remember, he had a post-it note sitting on the dashboard of his truck. Every time I got in that truck and sat down, I can still remember the verse of Scripture that he had on there to this day. Why? Because it was in front of me. Every time I hitched a ride from the guy, there's the verse. See, you got to do the same thing in your life. Keep the promise in front of you. Keep the vision in front of you. My goodness, what is it that you are believing God for? What is it that you want? Is it restoration in your family? Get a picture of your family and put it in front of you. Start to pray for them. Start to declare things about them. Start to lift them up. You believe in God for, for a husband or a wife, man? Hey, put a ring up there. Start declaring, God has the right person for me. I'm going to be patient and wait. I'm not going to make it happen in my own strength. I'm not going after every good-looking thing. I'm waiting for the God thing. Start to declare the promise of God. My goodness, that's why married people, hello, that's why you wear a ring. It's to remind you that you're married. You're in covenant with somebody. And if you're having troubles in your marriage, every time you see that ring, it's time to pray for your spouse and pray for yourself that God will change your heart as well as their heart. <laughs> got to see it. Got to get a hold of it. Habakkuk 2, Habakkuk 2, 2 and 3 in the message. You don't have to turn there. Habakkuk 2, 2 and 3 in the message. Then God answered, write this. Write what you see. Write it out in big block letters so that it can be read on the run. This vision message is a witness pointing to what's coming. It aches for the coming. It can hardly wait, and it doesn't lie. If it seems slow and it's coming, wait. It's on the way. It will come right on time. That's a word for you in this house today. It's a word for me in this house today. Final thing for tonight. We're going to live Bigger for the Lord, it means something. Living bigger for the Lord means, number one, sacrifice for the promise. Number two, dwell on the promise. And number three, most important of all, is to believe the promisor. Believe the promiser. His name is Jesus. And in him, all the promises of God are yes and amen. And therefore, you've got to believe on Jesus. You've got to put your faith and trust and hope in Jesus. Don't put it in a man. Don't put it in your own strength. Don't put it in the strength of a system or of a dollar or any of that kind of stuff. Put it in God. Start to trust God, believe God. And when God speaks and tells you to do something like Abraham, you step out in faith and believe God. Start to walk. Start to take little steps. Go in the direction that God is calling you to. And as you do, God will show you where he's taking you. God will supply everything you have need of. God will open doors no man can shut. He will shut doors no man can open. God will protect you. God will keep you. God will bless you so that you can be a blessing. Why? Because you participate take of the blessing of Abraham. We've got to believe on the promiser. Final thing for tonight, believe the promiser. Now, after God promises Abraham descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, we're told in Genesis chapter 15, Genesis chapter 15, verse number six, and this is quoted many times throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament. It's an important part of our doctrine. It's an important part of our faith and what we believe, why we believe Genesis chapter number 15, verse 6, it says, And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Abram didn't just try and, uh, it didn't really work out for me, God. I never really bought any 
land except to bury my wife. God, I failed. I didn't have any monument built to my name. You said you were going to make my name great, and when I died, two of my sons came and buried me. See, it wasn't about that. It was about believing God. The Bible tells us that he continued in faith, looking for a city that was not here on the earth. Why? Because he was looking for better things. See, Abram, even though he saw the land, it was great. Even though he walked around it, even though he camped and stayed there, he knew that it was bigger than his current natural situation and wasn't just looking here earth side. He was looking up to God, heaven side, and was believing God for a continuing city where righteousness dwells. See, he believed the Lord, and the Lord accounted it to him for righteousness. Last verse for tonight, Hebrews chapter 11. I want you to see this. Hebrews chapter 11. Sometimes you got to get a faith filled friend or a faith filled partner with you to believe God with you. In this instance, Abraham had a wife who was going to have to be involved in this process with him because, you know, men cannot make babies on their own. And without getting into the details of that, I believe you all know what I'm talking about. He, he needed a Sarah in his life, right? It was his partner in the promise. And this was somebody who was faith-filled as well and who they, they encouraged one another through the struggles. They went through trials. They did, like I said, they didn't do everything right. But hey, they were still moving forward with God. And sometimes we hear, you know, the corrections. Sometimes we hear that they did things right. And I love the fact that the Word of God contains that for us because, you know, we can get so discouraged that when we step out in faith and when we try something for God or, or we mess it up or we do the wrong thing, oh, God's probably cast that dream off. We're probably done with that thought. And yet God says, camp out, stay, dwell on the promise, believe the one who promised. If you're ready to make a sacrifice for it, hey, you'll receive it in due time. And here in Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 11, if you have the NIV, do not look at this verse. And the reason why I say that is because it changes the way the verse is written. I want you to see it in the New King James Version. I'll put it up on the overheads for you. Okay, if you have the New King James or the Old King James, you're cool, all right? For the rest of you guys, check out the overheads if you don't have that version, all right? Look at what it says. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. See, she was a partner in the promise of God. Look at this. And she bore a child when she was past the age. See, Sarah couldn't have Isaac until she couldn't have Isaac. See, she had a dream... But that dream had died, and it wasn't until it was impossible for her to have children that God made it possible for her to have children. There was something so big that she could not do it on her own. And so she herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age. Why? You ready for this? Because she judged him faithful who had promised. In other words, she sacrificed for it. She camped out on it, and she believed the promise. Or she believed God. She judged him faithful who had promised. Yeah, she laughed. Now, we know that. She laughed. But God said, hey, is there anything too hard for God? I can do this. You're going to have a child. And she judged him faithful who had promised. And therefore, had the God dream birthed in and through her. She was the vessel that God used. My goodness. Church, what do you believe in God for in your life? What is it that God is speaking to you? What is the God dream on the inside of you? What's the God thought that you're thinking? Well, what, is the, what is the promise that you see in the word? What is the thing that God is speaking to you? What's the fresh thing that God is opening up to you? Hey, it's time to start sacrificing for it. Time to start living, staying, and dwelling in it. And finally, let's believe God, the one who promised. If you got something from God tonight, come on, let's give God a great big praise. Hallelujah. Hey, you guys have been great tonight. I really believe that you guys got something from the Lord. Uh, just a, a fun time in the word of the Lord, in the presence of God. Let's not stop there. Let's make sure that you're right with God before you leave this place. I don't want you to leave this place and die and you end up in hell and not go to heaven. It'd be a tragedy. I don't want that. God doesn't want that. Listen, you don't want that, to be honest. You say, but pastor, I don't believe in hell. Well, hey, that's a convenient thing. But burying your head in the sand and saying that something's not real doesn't make it any less real. You're going to have to deal with it. Why? Because hell is in the Bible. It's in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. Jesus talked about it. You're not going to escape it just by denying, denying its existence. Let's, let's talk for a moment. Sometimes people say, well, I believe that all roads lead to heaven. And that's another convenient thought, but you know what? It's not reality. 
Because Jesus came and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by me. Not going to get there your way. Not going to get there my way. Not going to get there some well-meaning church committee's way. All roads look, don't lead to heaven any more than all roads lead to the moon. So you got to get there one way. Sometimes people say, well, I'm going to go to heaven because I've been a good person, done a lot of good deeds, and I know God lets good people into heaven. I haven't been really that bad all my life. In fact, I was bad, but I changed. Now I'm good. I, I've been working on my resume, so to speak, with God. And done a lot of good deeds and helped people out and gave money to charities and been involved in many uh, uh, missional causes and things like that and, and, and been nice to my neighbors. And God's going to let me to heaven because I've been a good person. Now, while those are, again, nice thoughts, they don't come from the Word of God because you know that nowhere in the Bible say God just lets good people into heaven. And only good people or you, you can be good enough to work your way into heaven. It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible to say help out and give money to charity to be missional or causal or any of those kind of buzzwords. It's not about being nice to your neighbors or cleaning up your act in your own power because your goodness is like filthy rags compared to God's goodness. It means it's not going to get to stay. It's going to get thrown out. The Bible tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's not going to be there just by being good. It's God's heaven. You've got to get there God's way. Now, sometimes people look at that and they say, well, you know what? I know that God's way is by going to church. I was raised in church. Parents took me to church as a child. Told me we were Christians growing up. Hang a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck. Had you christened or baptized as a child. And, you know, you're not any other religion. You're born in America. Not a Buddhist or a Muslim or a Hindu. And everybody born in America gets to go to heaven. We're not any other religions. Therefore, we're Christians. Right? Wrong. You know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you attend church as a child. Parents tell you you're a Christian. You think of yourself as a Christian. That makes you a Christian. Nor in the Bible say you attend religious classes, wear religious jewelry, be baptized or christened as a child, be born in America, or that because you're not some other religion, that by default, God lumps you into category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. It simply does not work like that. Tonight, let's love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Some of you might have said, well, but you know, not only when I was a child did I go to church, here I'm in church right now, and, and I consider myself to be a Christian. Isn't that good enough? Well, listen... It's not good enough because it's not according to what God says. No one in the Bible does it say. Check it out. Nowhere. Sit in church service, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. It's like going down to Dodger Stadium, wearing the Dodger uniform, bringing your bat and your ball, sit in the dugout and think that you're going to get to play in the game. They're going to find you sitting there, drag you out and lock you up. Why? Because you're not one of the Dodgers. And therefore, you can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian, and that makes you a Christian. Come on, let's listen up. So listen up, don't let anything distract you right now. This is important. This is talking about your eternal destiny right now. Some of you in this room said, well, pastor, I understand that, but not only have I attended church, but I got involved. My last church, I sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions. People thought of me as a leader. I taught in the Bible classes, even got a membership card to that church. That's great. Glad you did those things. But could you just show that to me in the Bible where that gets you into heaven? It's not there. No one in the Bible will say help out, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions. People think of you as a leader. You teach in the Bible classes that you get to go to heaven. And God's not looking for membership cards to a church before you enter the gates of heaven. Sometimes people say, but I know God. Someone told me that if I knew God, I'm a Christian. I get to go to heaven because I know God. I can quote scriptures to you. I celebrate Christmas and Easter every year of my life. That's great. I'm glad you can do, do those things. But if you'd read your Bible, you'd know that the Bible says that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible says the devil himself believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and can quote scriptures, and he's not a Christian headed for heaven. So everybody look up at me, me for a second. Look up here. This is not about what you have in your head. This is not about having some mental assent towards God, having head knowledge about who Jesus is. And that gets you right with God, or being able to celebrate a holiday, or being able to quote scripture. But rather, this is not about what's in your head, but it's about what's in your heart. What have you done with your heart? Have you given God all of your heart? Because if not, come on, tonight, listen up. Listen up. The man by the name of Nicodemus that Jesus was speaking to, religious leader of his day, good guy, did a lot of good things. He got involved. He knew some things about God. He could quote scriptures. People looked to him to find out about God. He, he, he was a teacher in Israel. And yet Jesus doesn't tell him, hey, you're doing a good job, man. Keep just doing what you're doing, and I'll see you in heaven. No, he doesn't say that at all. Rather, what does he say? He says, Nicodemus, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born Again, now I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They raked it through the, through the coals. This is not about what society says or books or television, movies, the internet. It's about what the Bible says. What does being born again really mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. 
means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. The book of Revelation, the third chapter, Jesus is speaking to the church just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what is he saying, lukewarm? What's that all about? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then, occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. Why do I say look out? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, your call, your choice. Will you give them all of your heart? Will you give them all of your life? In a moment, I'm going to do this. I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three, bang, pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to lift your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to be born again. I want to be headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, whoa, time out, pastor. If I raise my hand, I'd be embarrassed. Uh-huh, you might be, but get over that embarrassment. Why? Because think of it. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Tonight, come on, push past the embarrassment. And let's get right with God in a safe and friendly place. Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, it's better than being apart from God. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. Hey, I'm a man. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it and put it right back down. But if you choose to sit there and do nothing, hey, you've made a choice. So tonight, your call, your choice. I've done my job. I've loved you enough to tell you the truth. God's done his job, sending Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross. He died so that we could be forgiven of our sins and took our punishment on himself. He's raised again to life so that we all could live with him. Now it's your turn. Will you give him all of your heart? We give him all of your life. Will you lay your life down like we talked about in sacrifice to pick his up? Go and be with Jesus for the rest of your life and for eternity. Come on tonight, you can do this. Who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never given God all your heart and life? Come on, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Come on, you can get right with God. Simply raising your hand in a safe, friendly place. All across this auditorium, back in the families, wherever you're at, watching by television, the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or online, wherever you're at all over the world, you're ready to raise your hand. God sees you, and then you can tell an usher, come into the church service afterwards, or if you're online, I'll tell you what, you, what to do in a moment. Here we go. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Just raise them up high right now. Raise them up high right now. Thank you. There's one. God bless you. Where are you at? Come on, come on, come on, come on. There's two. God bless you. Gotcha, gotcha. Let me ask real quick. This is crazy. This is crazy. Where are you at, number three? Come on. Number three, I know you're out there. Give me a little wave if that's you. Thank you. Thank you, number three. God bless you. Real quick, back in the family room, number four, number five, number six, and number seven. Is that right, four? Thank you. Seven wise people already. Man, I know there's more. I know there's more. Come on, the Spirit of God is tugging on your heart if that's you. If that's you. Don't let anything distract you right now and keep you from the promise of God. Who else tonight? You know you need to give all your heart and all your life. If that's you, come on, if you're sitting there wondering if you should do this, yeah, yeah, you should. The best decision of your entire life. It's tough. I know sacrifice is hard to do, but man, best thing you'll ever do. Come on. This is where it starts tonight, by giving God all your heart and all your life. There's seven wise people already. Where are you at, number eight? Come on. You're sitting there wondering if you should do this. Go for it. Go for it. Anybody else real quick? Come on. Come on, come on, come on. I'm going to close this up in a minute. And if you need to do this, you're going to miss this opportunity. Don't miss this opportunity. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? Last call. Last call. You were waiting for it. Said, if he gives one more call, I'll do it. Come on. Come on, if that's you, number eight. God just spoke to you right now. If that's you. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? I can't make you do it. I wish I could. I wish I could wave a magic wand over you and poof, you're safe. It doesn't work like that. Anybody else? Thank you, number eight. God bless you. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, real quick, all eight of you. Or number nine, number 10, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. Here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand and give a clap and a shout as we do. Once you get your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church, get in the aisle and meet me up front. 
because we're going to change destinies tonight, but we can't do that until we get you down here. No one leave during this time. Please don't be rude. We're trying to get people to come forward. You go that way, they'll follow you that way. Okay? Let them come forward tonight. If, if that's you, you raised your hand or you should raise your hand. Let's all stand and welcome them. Get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front right now. You just come right now. Come on, come on. Jesus, I you need to come. Come on. Get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front right now. From the family rooms, you want to bring your kids? Come on down. You're welcome. You're welcome. Jesus, I believe. You're listening in the foyer and you raise your hand. Come on in. Jesus, I belong. They're coming. Let's give them a hand. Come on, you can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. You're the reason that I live. God, you guys have come. Can, can you hang tight for one second? I really do appreciate you guys coming forward. That was a, a bold move, sacrificial move, strong, and I appreciate you guys. But I believe tonight, and, and you know, we're always under the clock here. Is it okay if I just take a moment to invite the people to come forward? I had seven hands raised. Oh, my goodness. God just spoke to me. There should have been 20 that raised their hands. And now three are here at the altar. Let me tell you something. Not going to make it. Because you've got to lay your life down to pick his up. And if you're still holding on to your life, you can't open up your hand and receive his life. Tonight, if you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, I'm giving you one more plea from the Holy Spirit. I can feel the heart cry of God right now for your life. The Lord is pleading with you right now. Come. Just come. If that's you, just come home right now. Come on. Come to, come to the altar right now. If you know you need to give God your heart and life, just get in the aisle. Meet me up front. This, th listen, I'm trying to shut this down because this is uncomfortable for me. And I know people have to get to work tomorrow, have to get their kids to school tomorrow. But the Spirit of God is stopping everything right now. Because even though we talked about big numbers, one of the biggest numbers to God is one, one soul. And so if that's you tonight, come on. If you know that you need Jesus, you know that if you died, you'd end up in hell and wouldn't go to heaven, don't wait. Come on, just make your way to the front while I'm talking. Just come on right now. Step out. Listen to the leading of the Lord who's saying, go, come on, go. Just like Father Abraham. Didn't even know where he was going, didn't know what he was getting into, but he started to walk. They're coming. Come on, you can come too. Anybody else? Come on, step out in faith. Sacrifice. Lay down your life to pick up his life. Anybody else, real quick? You know you need to give God all your heart and life. Come on. The Spirit of God is just pleading with you right now. Just come. Just come. Just come. what I'm going to do. I'm going to minister to these guys. And then afterwards, after church, there's some teams up here that are praying with people. If you needed to do this tonight, these teams are going to be up here ministering prayer for healing, for baptism of the Holy Spirit, whatever your prayer needs are. And if you didn't give your heart to the Lord here, come and talk to one of those people and say, I need to give my heart to Jesus. And they'll minister salvation to you right there. 
Okay, now you guys up front. Hey, congratulations. Thank God you guys have come. We're so excited for you. There's a great life ahead of you. All right? Real quick, right over here to my right and your left. This is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on, okay? He's going to pray with you a simple prayer to invite Jesus into your life. You're going to be born again. You've got a brand new life ahead of you. Now you've got to find out what to do next. We have a little booklet we'll give you. It's free. It's thin. It's easy to read, okay? And then finally, he's going to introduce you to a friend here in church that we call a spiritual personal trainer. Heard of a physical trainer at the gym helps you get strong? A spiritual personal trainer will do that for you spiritually. Now, it's easy. Again, it's free. He'll let you know how it works, and then he'll let you come right back out. Now, I'm going to make a promise to you guys. Okay, remember we talked about promises tonight. You, you stay. Stay on the promise. That if you give one year of your life to this church, here sitting under the word of God here at The Rock, at the end of that year, you'll look back on this year and say, wow, I didn't know that I could be this blessed. And for the rest of your life, God will give back to you in blessings and promises. Am I telling the truth, everybody? Yes. Amen. So if you guys will, just make a left turn and follow Pastor Joel right this way. And give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.